الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Brothers and sisters in Islam here at uh, third space. I don't know where the first and the second is. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We look tonight at a very important subject, seldom discussed, of spiritual arrogance. In the history of religion, one people have distinguished themselves as the chosen people of Allah Most High. Banu Israel, the Jews, and they confer upon themselves, <laughs> wrongly so, the status that heaven is reserved for us. We are the chosen of the Lord Most High. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re refutes that in the Quran. <laughs> when he says, بَعْدَوُذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ أولياء لله من دون الناس فتمنى الموت إن كنتم صادقين. If you indeed believe in this nonsense that you are the chosen of the Lord Most High to the exclusion of all of the rest of mankind, heaven is reserved for you. Then why don't you deserve? Why don't you seek death? Why don't you ask for death? If you truly believe in what you are saying. But they will never ask for death. They will never seek death. Because they know very well. The wickedness. Of their beliefs. What is surprising is today we have. Not one chosen people. <laughs> but even within. The Muslim world we have many chosen people. Many groups within the world of Islam who hold the same views that we are the chosen. The spiritual arrogance has descended within our ranks. And this group believes we are rightly guided. And the rest are misguided. And their beliefs are stuck in concrete. You can talk and talk and talk to them. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You can't shift them. No. They're stuck in concrete. They'll never change. Spiritual arrogance is a dangerous thing. The belief that we are the ones who are rightly guided and the rest who are not with us are misguided is a dangerous thing. To hold yourself as an elite above the rest of Muslims and look down upon the others with some sense of scorn <laughs> is a dangerous thing. And tonight we're going to look briefly at the dangers. And we pray that Allah may take these words of ours to Ikhwan al-Muslim in Egypt I take these words of ours to those Sufi movements who support the government, the ruling party in Turkey. Take these words of ours to the Islamic movement, the Islamic party here in Malaysia. Take these words of ours to Tabligh Jamaat. Take these words of ours to the Salafi Muslims. Take these words of ours to all those within the fold of Islam who are adamantly confident 
that they are on the right path and the rest of us are somehow inferior to them and misguided. I want to begin with a startling example and to show how this malady the spiritual disease is connected with Akhirul Zaman. Akhirul Zaman is that time when Allah will release into the world Gog and Magog. And Allah will release into the world Dajjal. But these distinguished Islamic movements around the world, you can wait and wait and wait and wait and wait you'll never hear them speak a single word about Dajjal about Gog and Magog and yet we are we are the rightly guided well the Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam about Akhiru Zaman and all those who are not blind, they still have eyes and they could see, would recognize the sign. He said about Akhiru Zaman, you're going to have the tall buildings. The tall buildings are here. People are competing with each other in the construction of high-rise buildings. Should I continue and give more and more and more and more evidence? To convince them that this is Akhir Zaman? Or is it that they are deaf? They can't hear me. We've been lecturing to them for 20 years or more. It seems as though they are deaf, they can't hear. This is Akhir Zaman. Get off your high horse of spiritual and religious arrogance and step down, and become a little bit humble. And understand that this is Akhiru Zaman. Gog and Magog were released into the world in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. But you never hear them talking about that. None of these distinguished Islamic movements, none of them. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam that Gog and Magog would pass by a river and drink it dry. They would be the trademark of Gog and Magog. One of the trademarks would be the waste of water, <laughs> overconsumption of water. A man was performing wudu. And Nabi Muhammad wasalam, was passing by and saw him and stopped him and asked him, what is the explanation for this israf, waste of water in wudu? The man asked, O Messenger of Allah, is there such a thing as israf in wudu? Yes said the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, do not exceed the limit, even if you have, help me somebody, even if you have huh? a running stream of water before you, no shortage of water. What is the limit? Here is the limit. This hat will hold more than the amount of water we are supposed to use in wudu. And yet they say, we are the rightly guided. <laughs> we are the ones who are rightly guided. This is the amount of water you're supposed to use in wudu. Along comes Gog and Magog. How did the Prophet 
sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam perform wudu if you do not do know this would you know about islamic political theory i ask this to ikhwan al-muslimun who has made such a mess of egypt they do not deserve to ever 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 rule over egypt again never the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam will lift the container with his left hand and pour some water on his right hand why because he has to use the right hand as a cup to dip into the container and this is the amount of water ordained to be used in every act of wudu do they know this those who have such spiritual arrogance we are the rightly guided and when the prophet والسلام, was finished with his wudu if there was any water left in the container he would drink it but the companions would be rushing to try to get that water too but you have somebody standing by shouting at them bid'a and haram yeah they would be rushing to take the water to wipe to rub it on their bodies along comes gog and magog and he has corrupted their wudu and these glorified spiritually arrogant people are not even conscious of the fact that they have lost their wudu No longer do you have to wash the right hand because the water is coming from a a pipe, a faucet. Well, if you're using a faucet or a pipe, a tap, you'd have to take one hand and open and close the tap to fill this much water. Have you in your entire life ever seen anyone do that? Have you in your entire life ever seen these spiritually arrogant people who declare themselves to be the spiritual champions of Islam? Have you ever seen them performing wudu? And yet they come to tell us we are so we are inferior to them. They would even sit in our company when we talk. Oh no! As soon as the salat is over, they get up and they leave. They don't want to be in our company. They are the elite. They are the elite. They live in a kind of a comfort zone, and they don't want to be disturbed in their comfort zone. So let us disturb them tonight. So you're performing, you would do. <laughs> And now you are washing your mouth, but the water is still flowing. And you are washing your face, and shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! The water is still flowing, and yet you come to teach us about Islamic political theory, huh? and you cannot even perform wudu. What rubbish! What nonsense! Learn to perform wudu first <laughs> before you seek to give to the Muslims political guidance and economic guidance and monetary guidance and guidance in social affairs. At the end of this wudu, if you collect all the water which was used, it might fill this ten, twenty, thirty, sometimes fifty times. Go to where they're performing their wudu, and watch after listening to me tonight. But take a handkerchief with you to wipe the tears. To wipe the tears when you see what Gog and Magog have done. Inna yajuja wa ma'juja mufsidun fil ard, says Allah. 
Gog and Magog have been released into the world with this mission to corrupt and in the process of corrupting to destroy and they have corrupted your wudu and in the process of corrupting it they have destroyed it but al wudu miftahu salah wudu is the key to salah so if you've lost your wudu what is the status of your salah I ask you ikhwan al muslimun in Egypt I ask you party islam in Malaysia I ask you jamaat islami in Pakistan I ask you Salafi Muslims and Tabligh Jamaat and all the others who have this chip on the shoulder. What is the status of your Salat if you've lost your wudu? If the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were present today to see where wudu is being performed, I suspect that they will respond by picking up some big sticks and running us out of town. So this is not voodoo, this is Gog and Magog. This is Gog and Magog wasting water. So much then for the introduction to our brothers and sisters who hold this position of spiritual arrogance <coughs> with their views cast in concrete. We are superior. We are the elite. Is this connected with Dajjal? This disease which was there previously with Banu Israel, the Jews. That's their disease. And now it has come amongst us. We are the chosen people. <laughs> yes, it is connected with the job. And I want to take you now. Incidentally, it's time for you to study the subject of Gog and Magog. Because the corruption is not only water. The corruption is also the money that we are using that Sake was referring to. He didn't use the term that I use, but one day probably he will use it. I say of the modern monetary system of paper, plastic, and electronic money. And I can speak like this because I have studied international monetary e economics at two universities. I say of this paper money we are using that it is bogus, it is fraudulent, and it is utterly haram. When last have you ever heard some of their scholars say, say this? When last have you heard a Salafi scholar speak about the monetary system? That it is bogus and fraudulent and haram. When last have you heard Tablik Jamaat? Tablik Jamaat which is the only Jamaat in the world which believes that it can teach every subject under the sun. So he doesn't need Imran Hussein. So I'm not allowed to teach and to preach in any masjid controlled by Tablik Jamaat. No way in the world. Strange, isn't it? Mysterious, isn't it? Shameful, isn't it? Yes. There is corruption of the market. It's not just the money they were using, the market. The banking system has not emerged in, vac in a vacuum, isolation. No. It is a corruption of the market where now prices are no longer based on market prices. No. In addition to market price, you also now have a markup, which is the riba component. In every single transaction, you're now paying a riba component. So the free and the fair market is destroyed. But tonight is not the night for us to speak on riba. There is corruption 
of the political system. <laughs> oh yes. And there's corruption of the social and cultural life. What is the price that these people will pay for their spiritual arrogance? Let us begin with a hadith which is located in Sahih Bukhari four times. So it is known as Mutawatir from the several chains of narration. But strangely, these elite of the spiritual and religious world never, 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 never quote this hadith. No. <coughs> it is judgment day. And now this is a hadith al-Qudsi, direct speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says to Adam alayhi salam, take out the people for Jahannam, for the hellfire. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O oh Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and he says, out of every 1,000, Take 999 for the hellfire. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ were terrified when they heard this. So he, the Prophet ﷺ, then smiled at them and said, Good news for you. The one for Jannah would be from your ranks. A people who are humble, spiritually humble, intellectually humble, socially humble, not arrogant, never assuming that they are the elite of mankind, that they are the chosen of the Lord Most High. Now it's not only the Jews, these are also the chosen of the Lord Most High. So he said, good news for you. The one for Jannah would be from you. But then he went on to say, in one version of the Hadith, that the 999 would all be from Gog and Magog, indicating that this state of affairs will be located in Akhiru Zaman. This is not 999 out of every 1,000 throughout history. It is 999 out of every 1,000 in Akhiru Zaman, when the two major actors will be at work, Gog and Magog, corrupting and destroying, and Dajjal, with a PhD in deception. After listening to this hadith, are you still so confident? Are you still so confident, Jamaat Islami in Pakistan? Are you still so confident, Ikhwan in Egypt? Pati Islam in Malaysia? Hmm? Are you still so confident that you are rightly guided after listening to this hadith? when you do not even recognize to this moment that you are living in Akhiru Zaman. I want to turn now to the link with Dajjal. Spiritual arrogance, intellectual arrogance, elite status and the link with Dajjal. Is there, is it possible to establish that link? Yes, it it can be done. So let's try. There's only one surah of the Quran. Only one. Which has been linked by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam to Dajjal. Which one is it? 
Suratul Kaf. Suratul Kaf. He said, recite the first ten ayat or verses of Suratul Kaf. And in another hadith, the last ten. And in the third hadith, the opening verses of Suratul Kaf. Over the jal, and he will not be able to harm you. No. So there is a link between Suratul Kaf of the Quran and the jal. There is a second link, and that is that. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said every prophet has warned his people about the jal. <coughs> and Nabi Nu alayhi salam warned his people about the jal. But I am going to tell you something no one ever said before me. The jal sees with the left eye. He is blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one eye. Between his eyes, on his forehead, is written the word kafir. And uh, the definition of kafir is not non Muslim. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe all non-Muslims uh, kuffar. That's nonsense. No. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir. And every mu'min will be able to read kafir. A mu'min is one who has not only accepted the truth, but has so internalized it that it has entered into the heart and when it enters into the heart it's no longer belief it's now called faith what is faith in Bahasa? Kepercayaan huh? What's a big word, huh? <laughs> yes. When it enters into the heart it's no longer belief, it is now faith. I'm not going to try. <laughs> In Arabic, Iman. Iman. So everyone who has Iman, every mu'min, will be able to read Kafir. Whether he is Katib or Ghayru Katib whether he is literate or illiterate. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu would be able to read. But Abu Jahal will not be able to read. So we send Abu Jahal to the best optometrist it's called? The eye specialist? Yeah. The best optometrist there is Examine his eyes. What's wrong? How come Ali can read, but Abu Jahal cannot read? The report comes back from the eye specialist. Nothing wrong with his eyes. His eyes are perfect. Oh? Well then how come this one can read and that one cannot? Perhaps it's because this one is not reading with these eyes. Do we have any other eyes beside these eyes? There is no more important question that can be asked by anyone who is a student of knowledge than this question. <laughs> this is called epistemology. The branch of knowledge which studies knowledge. Do we have any other eyes beside these eyes? 
the modern world of secular scholarship says no the Quran says yes أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Will they not travel to the earth? Perchance that by traveling to the earth, the dead heart might come alive. فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ كُلُوبٌ يَعْكِلُونَ بِهَا And they'll now be able to understand what otherwise they could not. أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا And they can now hear what otherwise they could not hear. فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَ الْأَبْصَارِ it's not these eyes which are blind, says Allah. It's not these eyes which are blind, says Allah. وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ What is blind is the heart which is inside the chest. And so if this spiritually arrogant chosen people belonging to this Islamic movement and that Islamic movement and that Islamic movement. If they end up internally blind, <coughs> internally blind, then they will be like the Dajjal. They will see with only one eye. What will be the consequence? Surah Al-Kaf, again. Surah Al-Kaf answers the question. But before we go to the passage in Surah Al-Kaf, we've got to go to Sahih Bukhari. I've written a book entitled Surah Al-Kaf in the Modern Age. And there's a chapter of that book which is specifically dealing with this subject that I'm not going to deal with. Inshallah. Musa alayhi salam has taken Banu Israel over the Red Sea from Egypt into Sinai. And then after Allah punished them, banned their entry into the Holy Land for 40 years, they are now wandering in Sinai. They carry with them a mobile masjid, a tabernacle, a tent, and they would pitch the tent from place to place. And Musa -Islam would conduct a khutbah and teach Banu Israel. So he gave a khutbah upon which a man came up to him and said to him, Musa, Alayhis salam, what a wonderful khutbah. You must be the most learned man in the world. That's what they think they are. That is what they think they are. We are the last word in knowledge on this subject. That's what they think they are. And Musa alayhi salam replies and says, yes, I am the most learned. And my understanding is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom is using Musa alayhi salam to point to Banu Israel. That you Banu Israel, you believe that you are the most learned in the world. And he's just using Musa alayhi islam To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then responded to Musa alayhi salam and said, No, you are not. There is a servant of mine more learned than you are. And he said, I'd like to meet him. We eventually learned that this servant was, we don't know his name. Don't ask me whether he's alive today. Don't ask me whether he's a prophet of Allah. I only know about him what is located in the Quran and what is located in the Hadith 
and I have no interest in fairy tales. That's not scholarship. We know that he's, he's called Khidr alayhi salam. And when I teach a class of children, I call him Mr. Green. Because Khidr means green. Nabi Muhammad Islam said that he got that name because he came to a land which was barren. Today, the whole world seems to be like that. For those who see with two eyes. <laughs> he came to a land which was barren. And he sat down on that land and everything came out green, lusciously green. Like when an Arab comes to Malaysia, he says, this is heaven. <laughs> Greenery all around. Hmm? So Khidr alayhi salam, epistemologically, represents a different kind of knowledge. Not knowledge of those who are spiritually arrogant with a chip on their shoulders. We are the rightly guided and they are inferior to us. They're just like cockroaches. The chosen people of the Lord Most High among, amongst the Muslims now. We have them all over the place. The knowledge of this man is not like a gramophone record. <laughs> not knowledge that comes out of a factory. You memorize this kitab and that kitab and that kitab and that kitab and that kitab. And when you memorize 25 or 55 or 150 kitab, this kitab, that, ah, I'm a scholar now. <laughs> And then you spend the rest of your life repeating from memory what you had memorized. Oh, the Quran didn't come down to you. Allah sent down the Quran and He says it again and again and again and again. He has sent down this Quran, Likawmin Yatafakkarun. He sent down this Quran to a people who not only Think. But fikir is also thinking things out. So this is not mechanical knowledge. No. Khidr alayhi salam represents that kind of knowledge which is like the raindrops which fall from the sky. And when the raindrops fall from the sky, everything that's dead comes back to life. Words which inspire. Not words that you hear again and again and I'm tired of hearing this. Every Friday I go, every Juma I go, it's the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> I want to meet him, the one who is more learned than I am. And he is Khidr alayhi salam. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to take a basket. Put a fish into the basket. And go to the place where the two oceans meet. And that's where you'll meet him. I kind of a cutting him down to size eh? just a moment ago I'm the most learned of all men and now I have to put a fish in a basket what does a fish in a basket have to do with the subject when the fish comes out of the basket that's where you'll find him what do 
two oceans have to do when two oceans meet? What do they have to do with knowledge? It is mind-boggling. I am the elite of mankind. I look down upon the rest. I am the chosen. I have this intellectual and spiritual arrogance. And now I have to be reduced to this? Yes. It is very humbling now. Very humbling. So he takes a boy with him. And the companions of the, uh, uh, the commentators of the Quran tell us it was Joshua. And, uh, and Allah knows best. And they travel. While traveling, they came to a rock. And that is where the story begins in the Quran. And this is a link between Dajjal and intellectual and spiritual arrogance. They stopped at the rock to rest for a while. And Musa al-Islam fell asleep for a while. And when he woke up, they then proceeded beyond the rock. But now suddenly, لَقَدْ لَكِينَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَبًا How many of you have memorized Surah Al-Kaf? Nobody has yet? All right, next time I come, I'll see. Inshallah. This journey has now become wearisome. I'm feeling tired. There was no weariness when you were going towards the rock. The weariness has come upon me after leaving the rock. So long as you are walking on the right direction, there was endless energy, endless enthusiasm for the journey. As soon as you pass the rock and you're in the wrong direction, tiredness descended upon you. Praise be to Allah, who is so kind to his servants. To send such a message to a servant of Allah, telling him you're on the wrong path. From the time you find this tiredness descend upon you, life is becoming wearisome. It is Allah sending a message to you. You're on the wrong path. Go back to the rock. So Musa al-Islam says to the young man, take out some food. Let's eat. The young man then turned to look at the basket and said, oh my, I forgot to tell you. And Allah says, no, it is shaitan who caused him to forget. The young man said, I forgot to tell you what happened out there at the rock. And Allah says, no, it is shaitan who caused him to forget to tell you what happened at the rock. The, the, job, the, the fish jumped out of the basket and made its way in a wondrous way into the water. He says, but that is what we're looking for. Let's go back quickly. So they hastened back to the rock. And there was this man sitting on the rock. So Musa Islam greeted him with Assalamu Alaikum. The man said, what? A greeting like that? In a place like this, who are you? He said, I am Musa. Now listen. Which Musa? <coughs> Is it the Musa of Banu Israel? He says, yes. Indicating that this man does not belong to Banu Israel. 
There is someone who does not belong to the chosen people and who is more learned than the chosen people. Tablik Jamaat should take that and study it. The Salafis should take that and study it. Jamaat Islami in Pakistan should take that and study it. Party Islam in Malaysia should take that and study it. Ikhwan al Muslimun in Egypt should take that and study it. Are you the Musa from Banu Israel? Yes, I am. In that case, listen to how the most learned of all men speaks. Listen. In that case, Allah has given to you knowledge which I don't have. And Allah has given to me knowledge which you don't have. What humility. What grace. What wisdom. In the most learned of all men. Allah then speaks in the Quran about Khidr al-Islam and says آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا We gave to him two things. We gave to him knowledge directly from us. So this is not knowledge which comes to the rational faculty. This is knowledge which comes directly to spiritual insight. But Allah also gave to him kindness. I want to know where is the kindness? All of the Jaz warriors who have been taking Saudi money and weapons from NATO to go and fight their bogus jihad in Syria the way they fought their bogus jihad in Libya in consequence of which Libya today is now a NATO state and when they were slaughtering people in Syria with no pity whatsoever like mad dogs no pity whatsoever slaughtering people laughing while they slaughter Oh yes, one day, from a yamal mithkal a zarratin khayrin yara, from a yamal mithkal a zarratin sharrin yara. One day, you'll have to answer, unless you make tawbah and Allah forgives you, you'll have to answer. And so, these are the two components. These two things go together. You cannot have intellectual excellence you cannot scale the heights of knowledge unless you are a person every single particle of your being is embedded with kindness was this not the sunnah of the prophet but the intellectually and spiritually arrogant people, the chosen of Allah with their views stuck in concrete, they've lost even this kindness. Now, Musa Islam says, I want to accompany you so I can learn from you. That's good. But listen to the answer. <laughs> I consider these two verses to be the most important verses in the whole of Surah Al-Kaf. إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَتِيَ مَعَيَّ صَبْرَ وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرُ عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُحِبْ بِهِ قُبْرَ You will not be able to show patience with me, Musa. And how can you possibly show patience in respect of that which lies beyond your capacity to comprehend?
They should put it on a billboard on the way to the airport. You will not be able to show patience with me, Musa. The one who has this chip on his shoulder, the one who is so confident that he's on the right path, but the fellow can't even perform wudu. Go watch him when he's performing wudu. See whether he opens the tap and closes it, opens it and closes it, opens it and closes it, if he's using a tap. Go and watch him. You will not be able to bear with me in patience. And how can you show patience in respect of that which lies beyond your capacity to come to him? To which Musa al-Islam responds, I promise you, I'll be patient. Okay, you can come along. But on the condition is, keep your mouth shut. Don't ask any questions. See how to treat these people with their intellectual arrogance? This is the methodology with the intellectually and spiritually arrogant people. Keep your mouth shut. Don't ask any questions until I explain to you. Otherwise, go find another teacher. Leave me alone. The many Maulanas and Shiv, Shuyuka, they go. Leave me alone. And so they now travel until they came upon the seashore and they got on board a boat. And we go back to Sahih Bukhari. While they were on the boat, a bird came and sat on the, what is it called now? The bow of the boat? The bow, the bow. And the bird then flew down into the water, took some water in his beak, and flew back up. And Musa al-Islam and Khidr al-Islam saw it. And Khidr al-Islam said to Musa al-Islam, The knowledge that you and I have when compared to the knowledge that Allah has is like the amount of water in the beak of that bird when compared with this ocean filled with water so learn to be humble learn to be humble there are worlds of knowledge still to be explored do not be so confident that you know everything already and that you look down upon others hmm? and you bar others from coming into the masjid to teach Tabligh Jamaat. The only way you can go and teach in a masjid con controlled by Tabligh Jamaat is if you belong to Tabligh Jamaat. <laughs> So they got on board the boat and then Musa Islam saw Khidr Islam do something very strange. He took an instrument that is used in, the, in agriculture and he struck the bottom of the boat and made a hole, it's called scuttling the boat, scuttling the boat. So now it's going to leak. Why did you do that? That's a terrible thing to do. Oh, you're not supposed to ask any questions. And then the second event occurred with a boy. And then the third event occurred with the wall. And uh, that's your homework. I don't have to go and tell you all the rest. On all three occasions, the intellectually arrogant, who considered themselves to be the elite of mankind, 
and in the Muslim world, the elite of the Muslims were wrong in their judgment on all three occasions. Musa alayhi islam, and here Musa alayhi islam representing Banu Israel, felt that what was, what was done to the boat was wrong. What was done to the boy was wrong. And what was done in rebuilding the wall in a town which refused even hospitality was wrong. But the one who had knowledge from Allah, Allah blesses him with knowledge. And let me repeat one more time. This is epistemology. The knowledge does not come only from rational analysis. The knowledge also comes from spiritual insight. You cannot connect the dots which just ended in Crimea. You cannot connect the dots between 1917 and 2014. <laughs> the dots between 1917 and 2014 which just happened in Crimea. You cannot connect those dots without spiritual insight. Musa alayhi salam is wrong on all three occasions. And Khidr alayhi salam who is blessed by Allah with knowledge that is internally received and who is not arrogant Every single particle of the being speaks of kindness and rahmah. You cannot be arrogant and also be kind at the same time. No. He is right and this one is wrong. Before I send you packing, let me explain to you what you could not interpret. This was not explanations. These were not events which had to be explained. There's a difference between tafsir and ta'wil. Tafsir is explanation. Ta'wil is interpretation. And for interpretation you need insight. And on all three occasions Allah says, true khidr alayhi salam, that these are events which had to be subjected to ta'wil, interpretation. That is also akhir zaman. Why is it that after thousands of years that mankind have been using gold and silver as money, dinar and dirham, that suddenly dinar and dirham are taken away from the market. Why is it that an international monetary fund is created and the articles of agreement of the international monetary fund prohibit the use of gold and silver as money? Why can't Muslims recover dinar and dirham? I have been lecturing on this subject in Malaysia for 20 years now. I've been lecturing to PASS for 20 years now. PASS never listened to me. Until Dr. Mahathir, who is not a scholar of Islam. He's a secular nationalist, secular nationalist leader. The man never pretended to be a ustad or a sheikh. No. When he stood up for dinar, now Pass is minting dinar. But Imran Hussein has been talking to you for 20 years now. You would listen to me. <clears throat> Let me explain to you those things you could not understand. The boat has to be interpreted. That wheel. It belongs to poor fishermen. 
and there is a government coming to seize your property, the king. It happens every day. Eh? Oh yes, seize your property. Long ago, it is they used to seize your horses <laughs> from the time war breaks out. Hmm? <laughs> Tomorrow, they seize your bank accounts. I scuttle the boat so that when they come to seize the boats, they will not take this boat. And when they have gone, the boatmen can repair the boat. What you considered to be wrong and evil was in fact something good and just. What a monstrous mistake of judgment. That's the mistake you'll make. If you follow Dajjal and you see with only one eye and you're internally blind, that's the price you'll pay with your intellectual and spiritual arrogance as the elite of mankind looking down upon all the rest of the Muslims when you cannot even perform wudu. And then he went on to speak about the boy and about the wall I don't have to go on to those you can read the book and after that Musa -Islam was sent packing Nabi Muhammad -Islam commented and said I wish Musa -Islam had shown more patience we would have learned some more from Khidr -Islam. this is Muhammad -Islam, the most learned of all men and this is the man he's saying, I wish Musa Islam had shown more patience, we would have learned some more. What humility. What humility there is in Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. I wish I had the time to take you to the traps that Dajjal has put in the political system. I told Ikhwan al Muslim Moon, you cannot take the Islamic movement and register it as a political party and then fight elections that circus call elections. It's rarely a circus in the United States. Huh? And then Hopefully that you could win the elections and use Dajjal's system to bring Islam. You're living in dreamland. Is this a sunnah of Muhammad to Islam? They wouldn't listen to me. I can talk for the next 20 years, they will not listen to me because their views are stuck in concrete. But maybe if Dr. Mahathir were to get up tomorrow and explain Islamic political theory, they might wake up. I wish I had the time to explain to you how the political system came from Dajjal. I've done it several times in the past, so you probably are aware of it. That Allah is Al-Malik. Sovereignty belongs to Allah. And Dajjal brings a political system where it says, sovereignty no longer belongs to Allah. Sovereignty now belongs to the state. That is shirk. That is shirk. And when we go and register as a political party under their constitution, we also join in the shirk. You don't believe me? Then wait on Judgment Day. Wait on Judgment Day if you don't believe me. I wish I had the time to take you to Dajjal at work in the banking system. We have something bogus and fraudulent called Islamic banks. When last have you heard any of these Islamic movements declare the Islamic banking system is bogus and fraudulent? Do they ever say that? No. Dajjal is the one who took gold and silver out of the market, prohibited the use of gold and silver as money. 
replaced it with bogus and fraudulent paper money. If I had not studied international monetary economics, they might have been challenging me. To this day, no one has stood up to challenge me. No one dares to challenge me because I know my stomach. So they are silent now. Dajjal is the one who has done it. Have you ever heard any of these so-called Islamic movements ever declare that the paper money is haram? I met with the head of one of them in Pakistan, Jamaat Islami. And who knows, he might be listening to this lecture in a day or two from now on YouTube. I spoke with him for about one hour. And at the end of one hour, having explained to him that the paper money was bogus and fraudulent and haram, the man got up with indignation and he said, Ye to dhoka hai. This is bogus. Dhoka, bogus. He was convinced that the money was bogus, the Pakistani rupee. I then asked him, is it haram? He said, oh, no, 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 I can't say that. I can't say that. Only Mufti can say that. So you're Islamic movement, eh? And you're waiting for Mufti. Well, you could wait for another 50 years <laughs> for Mufti to say that the paper money is bogus and fraudulent. And you say you are the Islamic movement. You say you are the elite. You say you are superior to the rest. And you look down upon the others when you cannot declare and recognize the paper money to be haram. Mm -hmm. It is enough for me. I have provided adequate evidence to give the mother of all warnings to all those within the world of Islam who are following in the footsteps of the Jews who came before them, holding the view that they are the chosen of Allah that they are on the right path, <coughs> that all others are inferior to them, and they're looking down upon all others. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might open the eyes of those whose eyes can be opened. Forgive them the sins that they have committed, and open their hearts that Allah's nur might enter their hearts. And they may be, may be able to see what otherwise they cannot see. And then become a people of kindness rather than arrogance. So that we may be able to escape from the predicament in which we are today. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim. Wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawab rahim. Bi rahmatika ya rahman rahmin. Ameen.